this case, well, your meeting is called to order. We will need a roll call to determine if we've got a quorum. Right. Um, Fagerland. Here. Fagerland. Here. Fagerland. Here. Fagerland. Here. Jelenic. Here. Wilson. Here. Cairns. Do you have a quorum? Okay, was this meeting properly noticed? Yes. Okay, excellent. Next on the agenda, approval of minutes. Uh, meeting minutes from prior meetings. Once you've had a minute to review those, entertain a motion to approve them. And I have, there should be one, one uh, that was with the ETZ board and then one that was just recently attached that is from August 23rd. If you're not looking at the um, packet from the website, I have a printed copy of those August minutes that were just put there. I'll leave it for the printed. Copy. Yes, I didn't get to you yours in time. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from 91923 for the ETZ, as well as the planning minutes from 82323. Motion from Ms. Tepley. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Jelenic. Any discussion of the minutes? Hearing all in favor of approving the minutes from the last two meetings, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Minutes approved. Next discussion and possible action items. Item 2, public hearing for the request of Land Division on Tax Parcel 276-1712-1000 at 1000 U.S. Highway 14 West. Jason, do you have anything prepared on this one? Uh, that, that one is not. She, uh -huh. she, okay. Second. <laughs> Just asking if either one of you had any information or if only had any information prepared on item two on the agenda. Yes, that would be Mark Stewart. So that is a uh, 1.4 acre land division uh, that is currently under ownership of the Richmond County Public Works Standing Committee. Um, and I believe the uh, surveyor is here to discuss that. But uh, the property is, uh, from our standpoint, meets the lot size requirements. It's currently zoned R1 single family, meets the road frontage requirements, access, setbacks. Uh, the one thing it is in floodplain, and that is noted on the certified survey now. Okay, and I, I believe you're correct. The surveyor is present. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm good. Right. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Any comments or thoughts on this parcel? Anything we need to know? Um, the map pretty much shows everything that's that's there, and and basically the county wants to create a a new parcel there. There was a survey that was done back in the '70s that actually was a similar configuration, but of course, <clears throat> since that was done back in the 70s and was never conveyed to a new owner, that parcel didn't technically exist. So that's why we're back with a certified survey map here. Okay. Okay. So the county just want, needs to redo something that was done because it wasn't um, filed correctly. Is that the right way to say that? Well, it, it, it takes a deed to actually, a deed of conveyance to a new owner to actually create the parcel. So that parcel was, even though it was surveyed, was never actually created. So I need to do this so that it exists. It, it actually creates it, yep. Okay. Jason, I know you're looking at that. I have the address, but where exactly is it? Like if I'm driving by it, where is it? You know, the well, it's called Hill Buildings or yeah, whatever yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is right East Hall. Yes. Got it. Yeah. No problem. Got it. Perfect. I was going to say it must be right there at the campus then. So they never were correcting something that wasn't done correctly so that this parcel exists so that East Hall can be what it is. Uh, right. Is that, is that about yeah. it? If you'd like some of the history. Um, so when it was originally built, that building was contemplated as a health and human services yep. county building. Yep. It was then transferred into the auspices of the memorandum of agreement between the county and uh, the UW system, right. which I, presumably was why that initial survey was done. Um, but because it wasn't that that 
transfer was never recorded anywhere. That's why the, there was never a deed done or anything like that. That was subsequently then removed from the memorandum agreement and then re-added at one other point. Um, and then uh, once the UW system announced their end of in-person instruction and now closure of the campus, uh, the county elected to um, sell the building to right. the Richland County or Richland School District, <coughs> right. um, which is subject to a land contract, which so far as I'm aware is ongoing, and I have reason to believe I'd know if it wasn't going well. I would bet you would. Okay, so for not ever having moved, East Hall's gotten around a little bit. Yes. <laughs> through the years. Okay. Uh, so the okay. So that's the whole intent. That's why we're here. Just basically correcting the mistake so the parcel actually exists, so it can be what it is. That about it, Sean. Okay. Any other questions or comments for anyone here? I got one question. Is that hooked up to city water and sewer? Because I see the adjacent property has a septic tank to access. I don't know for sure. I thought all of the campus buildings were, but like you said, it wasn't always a campus building. So. Right. And then so the campus has its own uh, wastewater and water system that they that is theirs. They own it. They're served, but then it's connected on, I believe, to the city at a point. Um, it's my understanding that this is included in that, but we would have to verify to know for sure. I think I think the the whole the septic tanks that you're seeing on my map there. I don't know for sure what those are for, but with with uh, Norm Small Engines and Sports being there, I don't know if that was a holding tank for you know maybe some for the shop there or something like that. I don't know. Okay. So this is a public hearing for the request for the land division on this parcel. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Okay. <laughs> All right. Legally, I have to ask that three times, so I will do that for the second time. This is the public hearing for the request of land division on tax parcel 276-1712-1000 at 1000 U.S. Highway 14 West. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Okay, third time, public hearing for the request of land division tax parcel 276-1712-1000 at 1000 U.S. Highway 14 West. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Okay, so hearing no other requests to speak, no other comments, I'll we'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing on this request for the land division. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Motion for Mr. Jelenic. Is there a second? No second. Second for Ms. Tepley. Any discussion on closing the public hearing? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Okay, public hearing is closed, which puts us to item three, considered a request for land division of the same parcel. Okay, discussion. So we've kind of just gone over the history and why we're here. It seems pretty simple. Any comments before we move forward? Questions? Okay, if there are no comments or questions, no discussion, then I will entertain a motion to grant the request for a land division of tax parcel 276-1712-1000 at 1000 U.S. Highway 14 West. And I'll repeat to recommend to council. Yeah, to recommend to council to grant the, the land division. I'll make a motion to recommend to council to uh, grant the request for land division on parcel 276-1712-1000 at 1000 U.S. Highway 14 West. Motion from Ms. Tepley. Is there a second? No second. Second from Mr. Wilson. Any discussion of the land division of this parcel? Hearing none, I'd like a roll call vote, please. Okay. Miller. Tepley? Aye. Copperman? Aye. Jelena? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Fagerland? And she was having uh, difficulty hearing, but I switched some things on here, so let's see. Candace, are you able to hear us? 
always kept her on my phone. to council that the okay. land division be granted. Okay. Item four, Jefferson School redevelopment and rezoning. Um, I met with several of us have. Thanks everybody for your time. Thank you too for coming down, Mr. Surveyor. Sure. Okay. Uh, Jefferson School, we've met with the individual who um, had the winning bid. Uh, the last time I talked to him was about two weeks ago. That's the last update I have. Jason, have you heard from him since we met with him? Yeah, as a matter of fact, Mark and I have had, uh, I've had several meetings with him since that time, and Mark, had, uh, Mark and I had a meeting with him today, and so I'd like to pass that agenda item over, over to him to, to kind of talk about what we preliminarily think will be the chart, the path of action that will involve, you know, it's going to involve planning commission, so Mark will hand it to you. You want this, just tell me what you want to okay. throw it out. No, you're good. Um, so the subject property is the old Jefferson School. That's what's on the screen right now. Um, and the request is is fairly complicated um, as far as uh, what he would like to do. It's kind of a mix of residential opportunities, a mix of commercial opportunities. And so he's searching for... Uh, rezoning of the property and as he keeps talking about the potential uses of it from um, you know having maybe daycare there maybe having athletic type stuff um, to having uh, housing in there to having uh, professional offices in there that's a pretty diverse uh, mix of uh, zoning uses and so in looking at the r34 because that's what is currently zoned r34 looking at commercial um, a lot of what he's thinking about doing already fits into the r34 category i'm um, sure some of them might fall under like a conditional use as opposed to a regular use um, but if we go into the if we totally rezone him let's say to commercial Commercial brings in a whole layer of uh, zoning possibilities, right, for uses, and just kind of the, runs the gamut of it. And so, uh, what we looked at is what if we went through the planned unit development process? And what that does is that brings in the ability to um, adjust some of the standards, uh, possibly uh, relax some of the standards but also to truly define its own zoning on the property. Um, it doesn't change the underlying zoning of R34. It in essence puts uh, what would be a uh, overlay zoning on the property. And as, as a plan commission and, and through staff recommendation, you would pretty much establish what those uses would be on that property and any things that may be uh, adjusted based on that. In this case, the building's already there, so um, encroachments on setbacks may or may not be one of the requests of it, but it could be, um, like for an R34, maybe the, the unit size. Let's say the unit size uh, per uh, single family should be like 650 or 700 square feet, maybe he will want it at 500 or can something. You, can, you one second? Yeah. Candace, can you hear Mark speaking? Uh, yeah. Okay, we've got you. We can hear you. If you can hear us speaking in here, we're going to do it this way. I'm just going to keep you with on my phone. Okay. Okay. And even if I can just listen, that's fine. Perfect. So there we go. Work. Okay, Thank got you. it. You bet. Okay. Mark. Okay. So, you know, with that being said, you know, let's say with professional offices, there's parking requirements, off-street parking, um, and same thing with apartments, there's off-street parking requirements. And through the planned unit development process, 
um, those standards can be adjusted. That's why it's a, it's a unique feature to it. Um, and it's really up to, it's kind of a, a combination of working together of the applicant with the community. And there's a process. So it's not a one and done. It's not, hey, let's do a public hearing and rezone you from one to two, and then it's all said and done and it's all good. This is a process. Um, the applicant's gonna have to put stuff on paper and come up with what's called a general development plan. And that's gonna just be like, hey, I wanna do this, right? I wanna have some residential, I wanna have some business, I wanna have some um, fitness or rental opportunities or uh, commercial kitchen opportunities in the building. And if both parties agree and say, yep, that's, that's a good plan of attack, um, then he goes back to the drawing board and now he comes up with the next level which is called a specific implementation plan and then that is specific implementation plan it will define okay there's going to be four housing units and each unit's going to be you know 600 square feet and there's going to be four offices and there's going to be this and that so it gets down into the nitty-gritty at that point and then at that process you know comes back through the plan commission uh, both processes go plan commission then council um, and then the second step that specific implementation plan same thing plan commission first council second and then in the end a document is drafted that that you will approve or, or deny or change that outlines specifically what would take place on that property like I said it stays zoned R34 but it's got a planned unit development overlay um, that is specific to uh, the project at hand. And, it, and it's often done for um, larger development areas. So let's say you have 20 acres and the 20 acres calls for let's say 40 housing units, but they wanna have 60 housing units and they wanna have reduced setbacks and they wanna have a trail and and maybe uh, because they're having a trail in the backside, they don't want sidewalks out front. So there's uh, a lot of times the plan unit development is for something like that, um, just to change it to customize to fit the property. Um, but then things that are taken into account, like especially this one, is parking. You know, the on-street, off-street parking, the access points, um, making sure that's all accounted for in this project so that it's not causing an undue strain on the existing uh, system that is in place. And even from a, a utility standpoint, what's got to change from that? You know, is it going to be one water service? Is it going to be 10 water services? You know, so that all has to be brought into uh, account as we go through it, so. Okay, so at this point, so plan unit development, that's the first time I've heard that term, so thank you for that explanation. If you have questions, just ask them. Some places call it a planned development district. You know, there's all sorts of uh, names for it, but um, but they all have the same kind of the same premise behind it. Okay, so if the commission agrees and forwards this to the council to look at that or proceed, so then the landowner, the building owner, then um, what's the time frame here for him? Like how long does this process take before everything is set and he can do what he wants to do in that building? Uh, it's going to take, I would say on the short, it would be 60 days. But you're probably looking at a 90 day time frame um, because there's, the applicant's going to have to come back to Jason and I and talk about the process um, and basically put pen to paper. And then, you know, we'd be looking at in November meeting with the uh, plan commission depending on when he turns in his application I'm, I'm thinking on the fast end right does, does he know this time frame? yeah because he's coming his plan is to come back to Jason on next Wednesday good because I believe uh, his offer to purchase had a contingency with like a date by which it had to be rezoned I believe the I'm pretty sure it did so yeah. just asking so we don't get halfway through something and so if, if the timeline, if after next week, Wednesday, if the timeline extends beyond that, I would think that he'd be able to renegotiate that deadline with uh, the offer to purchase. Um, but we would be looking at, I would, on the fast, you'd be looking at um, 
truly the council meeting in January because it would be um, plan commission November, council December, plan commission again at the end of December, then council beginning in January it would be kind of the fast process to get it done. Because it's, it's truly two sets of meetings um, that they have to go through for this process. Makes sense. And that's... May I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Jamie, 26776, Highway 14 East. I'm interested, can you tell us who he is? Who is... It's not his public. It's up there. Carrie Norman is Carrie Norman. Oh. <laughs> it's, it was oh. announced publicly when they awarded the bid. I think the oops, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I think the one the one thing that um, Mark, I don't know if you can make clear or we may have to work at gaining clarification on is when we move from the general to the specific, because the way Kerry uh, he doesn't have tenants for the entire building, right. right? He's working trying to acquire those tenants. Yeah. So there's some question in my mind, at least, Mark. Maybe you can add clarity to that. Is like. I think that this group, we can get enough information from Kerry, he'll bring a plan, he'll say this is generally, that general plan Mark talked about, what we think would be acceptable. You guys pour over it and say, yeah, generally we think that's an appropriate use as well. Now the thing is, is that really sets Kerry free to probably try to go out and find out who really is interested in that property, and then we move to that specific. So the question I have, Mark, is on that specific plan, is, is it possible for us to come back a number of times as that building actually gets built out? Because he's... Let, come that, back to us or come back to the commission and, and council? What would be the appropriate procedure? Because if, if between his first tenant in the building, which could be shortly after he takes possession and gains the proper state permits, and the last tenant that comes into the building, it could be two years. So how we can't provide a specific plan to this body to make a decision on if he doesn't know what's coming two years from now. Sure. If, if he follows the specific implementation plan as approved, he does not need to come back to the commission or the council. But if he's going to change from that, that's a revision. He would have to enter into the process again to ask for a change to that. So, you, so if he, in the specific plan, has something identified as X amount of square feet of office space, um, professional office space, so long as whatever comes in two years is professional office space, doesn't have to be uh, revisited or amended. But if instead of professional office space, it was doggy daycare then it would need to come back and be amended? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's where that specifics come in. The specifics aren't, I'm going to have a chiropractor, you know, and I'm going to have Mark's dentistry here. That's not the specific. The specific is, is those uses. So I'm going to have space for an art studio. I'm going to have space for a medical clinic. I'm going to have space for uh, professional office services. And I'm going to have four units of housing. Well, if his four units of housing turns into six units of housing, that's not what's approved, right? Then we have to come back to it. And anything that falls under professional offices can meet the professional offices space. So, does he have to be that specific, like an art studio? I mean, could he just say a commercial space, or? Well, the the problem with that is our ordinance does say art studio as a retail sales or service business so he could get that specific um, he could just say retail sales um, or service business and that would be you could do an art studio you could do a bakery you could do a bank in that level of it just those three no there's oh there's okay. plenty more all right <laughs> i'm just drawing specific. yeah Okay. Yeah. So that's the thing that we want to make sure that the, the Planning Commission is comfortable with, is that it sounds like we may have an option on the plan. Would it be possible to use multiple uses in a space? Say it could be professional office or it could be retail. Yeah. Is it possible for them to say, yes, we would agree with those uses, 
and that be the specific, and and then if it's again with, uh, it's outside of that scope, then you would have to come back. Is it possible to have multiple uses? I would I would caution against that because they have different intensities. So a professional office, if it's my accounting firm. Um, it's going to be me showing up there and maybe once in a while a client, right? But if it's my bakery as a retail sales, I'm going to have people trafficking in daily. Constant. So that's, even though they're similar in function, they're different in intensity. So we don't, we don't want to have, we don't want to be, be so vague that they overlap like that. We want to be more specific. Um, so that it, the intensity is the same, even though maybe the use is slightly different. So I think that's a really good point in that here lies some of the complexity of us using planned unit development. Um, we had a great meeting with Kerry today. We're trying all that we can to be flexible because we understand it, it's just not every day somebody tries to take up over an old you know, an older building that was a commercial school building and try to convert it into something with multiple uses. So we're doing the best we can within the ordinances that we have um, to, to allow as much flexibility, but it, there could be some cases where we end up back before this body a couple of times because uh, Kerry has clearly said he's trying the best he can to make people aware that he's willing to work with them to provide space, but he doesn't have signed contracts, so there's a possibility that that he has to come back, and we may have to amend that specific plan. Um, so, um, yeah, another question. Um, so, with his offer to purchase, does he just have to do the general, or does he have to do the general and specific for his offer to purchase? That's I, that's really on how he's got it crafted. I know it says rezone is because that's been the discussion is that it's got to be rezoned by this date well creating a plan unit development is not officially a rezone but it kind of is a rezone so it's the gray area of it so it's going to be on him after we meet with him next week so he understands that to go back to that purchase offer and possibly amend his purchase offer that says approval of this planned unit development as opposed to approval of a rezone. But I don't know how much realtors and the bankers are gonna get into that semantics of it. If he's got a document from us that says approved, you know, or minutes from the meeting that says approved, I don't, that's probably good enough for, for that offer to purchase to take place. Okay, so then. That's, uh, is, Okay, so approved means the general and the specific from us. Yeah, because what you're doing is okay. your, your approval of the general is saying, yes, this is a good idea, we like it, now go to the next level and see what it's really going to look like in the end. And that's where he's got to be the one to put pen to paper, not you and and uh, Jason and I in our discussions with him have been cautious about giving him or taking that over for him he tried to ask us you write down what I can do um, no 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 no. I don't know what you want to do so I'm not gonna put down that so he's got to put that stuff down but we will coach him so he doesn't get specific to where he's pigeonholed and says, I'm going to have a bakery in this thousand square feet, and then we approve a bakery and no bakery ever shows up. You know, that, that's not how we want to operate. We would rather say it's a retail establishment. Um, but we want to be, that's where the specifics come in is not so detailed that he's locked in. But he's really the one that's got to be asking for it and you're the ones who need to be clarifying what he's trying to do so we're um, with, um, when i met with him in one subsequent phone conversation i think it's fair to say i'm sure you agree um he went in the order he needed to go the building was available when it was so he bought the building and is subsequently developing the plan i got it now what do i want to put in it okay mm -hmm. So, and he's been very broad, as you've stated, maybe some residential, maybe a dentist, maybe a lot of things. Yep. Okay, and I, as I think you're trying to say, he's going to be reaching out and whoever wants to sign a lease, then he's going to come here. So if we go with 
planned unit development, an example, what could he not put there? Whatever. So, so he he really loses the R three four. Okay. So he he could he could retain the R three four and build and just convert it into a quadplex, right? Have four units. He could make it into um, whatever else is a permitted use in R three four. He he always retains that. Anything that falls under conditional uses, he has to come back here for conditional uses in the R34 district um, that is outside of his um, approved, let's say it's approved, planned unit development. Um, but that, that's what he is allowed to do because it's R34. Um, so he can't say, oh, I'm going to put in a, uh, uh, a rendering plan converted into a rendering plan. Well, that, that's not R34 zoning, so he can't do that um, or other things that, you know, are nefarious to what's already allowed. So. Okay, and I'm guessing a little bit, but I doubt anybody on the Planning Commission has prior experience with planned unit development, so if there are more questions, please ask them. Uh, this is a city block in a residential neighborhood, so if you have questions, let's do it. Um, otherwise, um, I think Carrie's plan is pretty wide open, right? Find the tenants, bring them, and say, can I? Right. Um, Jason, did you have anything else to add on it? Just that we're, I mean, I'm, I think that this is great that we have a community member that's willing to try to tackle this, got a lot of experience in building, and, and it's hopefully putting a building back to use. The, the challenge that we have as your professional staff and that of course you have as a decision making body is that we have to make sure that we're following statutes and ordinances and, and um, we need to make sure that we're providing a safe environment and, uh, and, a, and a fair environment for all the people in the neighborhood. So yes, we absolutely want this building re, re, um, you know, repurposed. Um, we want to offer as much uh, flexibility to carry as possible, um, but at the same time, it's not possible for us to violate the ordinances and, and different statutes that we're required to follow, uh, and that's our responsibility as uh, both elected and, and hired officials to protect the constituents. So we're going to do our best, but there are rules. <laughs> So I do have another question. <laughs> um, with regard to the, um, the R34 mm -hmm. and the planned unit development. So is the planned unit development kind of within the three and four, or is that like separate? So it, the planned unit development can be used in any zoning district. Okay. It acts as an overlay. Oh, okay. So it, it sits on top of it and it's, it, the purpose is for creative ideas like this because zoning is very rigid and it's like you have to fit in this box. But the real world we live in, not everything fits in that box, right? So you have a school. Well, if a new school wants to come in, perfect, right? Then it's a perfect setting for it and come on in, let's get it done. But if it's gonna be repurposed into something, does it fit R34? R34 is how um, the comprehensive plan shows the property as well. So if he wants to rezone it, let's say to commercial, that's a change to the comprehensive plan as well. So that's another step in the process. Planned unit development allows the community to continue following the principles of the comprehensive plan and the principles of the uh, zoning ordinance, but allows for flexibility of certain requirements and a lot of times like I said it's it's setback issues that they want to avoid maybe it's steep slopes maybe it's stormwater management um, maybe it's parking things like that and or it's uses you know we want to modify the uses of the property um, to make it more you know uh, diverse and accepting in the area okay so you're just really kind of bending a few rules within the three and four for something like this to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. How many square feet is this building total? Oh shoot, he told us too. No, I don't remember. Um, 
I went to a one-room country school, so I know it's bigger than that. <laughs> I'll measure it really quick. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it turned into like the arena grade school and how they handled that and moved it into housing? Plus Did he send you here? <laughs> no. Because he brought up arena school when he came to us today. I think that's an incredible thing. <laughs> <note. laughs> yeah. yeah. I see how it is. He was pretty clear on the fact that he's he's really working hard to come up with ideas on how to repurpose this, and he said um, he's had several people mention the arena school because it is very popular. And he said I I drove by the arena school, and he says unfortunately there's no similarity. Right. There isn't. I mean, the parking and how they separated. They have the housing units, but then they also have the food pantry. They have a lot of different things in there. So the, the approximate square footage is about 26,200 square feet. 26,200? Yeah, okay. approximately. And not a lot of parking. So, you want the parking? Oh, well, sure. And we did talk specifically about parking because that's, that's one thing uh, we want to make sure. Of course, a, a public school building had uh, quite a few employees and people coming and going. So. Um, it's a neighborhood that was used to that type of traffic. Our consideration will need to be back to what the ordinance states with regard to if you have, you know, if you have, let's say, um, he does have an apartment there. We have to look at the ordinance and see what it required for parking spaces. Uh, we talked to Kerry a little bit about parking. He says, we've got that entire playground there. He said, I am willing to work at it and make sure that we've got appropriate parking so that you know nothing happens to the neighborhood that would cause um, any significant change in traffic versus what it has been historically. So there's another 27,500 square feet of hard surface. Really? Um, so but and one of the things he's talking about too is a daycare in there and with the daycare by uh, state codes you have to have so many square feet of outdoor space uh, based on the number of children that are there so that's got to be that would come out of whatever is allowed for parking so he, he'd have to allot you know so many square feet for the the kids to have outdoor space so um that all plays a part in this as well so any other questions at this point ray you look like you're thinking of something over there no you not at this point mark no it's good information it's just too preliminary to really come yeah. up with any real thoughts or decisions or ideas. Lisa? Just like Mark said, it's kind of up yeah, there. Very much so. Carrie Mines, like, well, I, I, I know. Yeah. We have talk. <laughs> Candace, any questions or comments? Oh, the one, I got a final whenever you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. So section 400.04, parent 21, of the ordinance talks about plan unit developments. It's about six pages and it walks through the process. And uh, we gave Harry a copy of this and I highlighted the section um, for him to look at. And it, and it goes through kind of like um, this step-by-step -step process and what he should include in his request uh, to us. What was that number again? 400.04, parent 21. Thank you. I have one. Just <laughs> okay. It's actually a part of an or the ordinance that is decent reading. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not all just uh, okay. This is boring, boring, boring. It's like oh okay, oh okay. There is some there is some mention of this in uh, in the RDA book. Actually, yes, there is. So I did hear the word before, but that. Was but we just haven't used it though, <laughs> right? So is um, is it correct to call this a rezone then, technically, or is it? Yes, technically it is a rezone. Okay, so we need, and then tonight we would be looking <laughs> for what a, a motion to recommend to the city council. No, we not. We don't need to do that tonight. Tonight was just about. Uh, about bringing information to you so that you're ready and you know your your mind is thinking about okay we're gonna have to deal with this planned unit development so that if you want to study ahead of time you can 
Um, but we didn't want to just show up with an application, a plan set, and then try to walk you through a process which is six pages long um, without you having some heads up. Um, I think it's also good to hear your comments and um, I think if there was any concern about what we've talked about here it would be, I believe it's appropriate for you to express that because this is a, a substantial process that we would be walking through with Mr. Norman and I think we need to be open-minded about it and if, if somebody right away is like, yeah, you know, this is not good, then um, it's kind of a way for us to, to see how you react to this because, again, it's a, it's a process, a big a couple, process to go through. A couple of things. Um, uh, everybody mentions the arena school. And I spoke to our building inspector, Mr. Tracy Johnson. This has been six months ago when the school district was still talking about selling the building. And he mentioned what they did in arena. He also mentioned in Mesa Maney they turned a school into senior living. And in Black Earth, they turned one into an antique mall. So there's a lot of this happening right now as school consolidation has continued. These buildings have come open. And, of course, the Rockbridge School is now a church and a daycare, which I think still has a senior meal site in it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uses going on mm -hmm. um, that you can do. And Kerry mentioned uh, the first thing he said, he talked about the arena building and the differences. And the way Jefferson is constructed is just very different. And he talked about the challenges and expense of trying to do exactly that. It's probably not that feasible, was the first thing I heard from him. Um, it's just interesting to hear that. Uh, we've got one that became a daycare here in town. So there's been a lot of uses for these buildings. Um, and he's going to, Kerry's a creative guy, and he's been uh, in the construction and business a very long time. I'm sure he'll bring us some interesting options. I'm sure those conversations have been. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, recently, there was an article in one of the state papers about um, the big house that was built out here for the teacher under HGTV. Anyway, and wasn't it this school, wasn't it Lincoln, where they donated a lot of money for the playground? And Jefferson School, yeah, it is. It, it is. is. Yeah. How much, do you remember how much it was? I don't. It was in the article, but I don't remember. I remember when they school. did it, but I don't remember the numbers. That was that school, though. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You put that basketball court in. Oh, okay. Okay. So are any other questions while we're on the topic? Okay. So I'm sure we'll be doing this again next month. All right. Okay. I do appreciate the heads up. Yeah, no doubt. The opportunity to read through and kind of wrap our heads around it. So thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, next uh, item five: TID development process. Yeah, I forgot we had that one. Let's do that one. <clears throat> so as we have mentioned, um, Thanks, thank you. Um, let me. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can find it here. Save that. It's not this one. We're done with that one. Done with that one. Okay. So um, we had uh, brought to your attention, the, um, the opportunity to move ahead with a couple of TIF districts, um, tax incremental finance districts, uh, planning, from a planning perspective, and we went through a process here and moved on to council, and council said yes, proceed with the planning. Um, so I just wanted to continue to provide you updates as we, as we get them. Uh, Ashley and I spent um, quite a bit of time with Southwest Regional Planning Commission identifying what could be appropriate development zones. That's kind of step one. They identify um, the, the individual parcels that are in those zones. And so when we came to you, we had identified um, two zones. Um, and this probably isn't a lot different than what I initially proposed way back before we even had uh, an official proposal from Southwest Regional. But this is the <coughs> Highway 14 East and the lower white right quadrant on the screen there. Um, that's the, uh, the new hospital property. Um, of course, there's property behind Walmart. Now, we aren't able to officially do this at this point in time to this extent because there would be, have to be annexation take place in order for us to actually end up with this map. So the rule is, is that any land that's currently in the municipality, it, it um, 
can be used inside of a TIP district as long as we follow the process and procedure and the, the elected officials say yes, that's good. So right now, this lower right, right quadrant is the property that would be annexed in um, by the hospital. Um, that would then give us access back to the west. This property here <clears throat> that's behind Walmart and off of O is not annexed in, but it is something that we're, we're contemplating and trying to have some conversations with. Um, you move along... Um, Along uh, the bike trail there, you can actually see the current city limits is this blue here. That's actually the city boundary in that space, is the bike trail wide. That's our city boundaries. And then it widens back out and cuts around uh, Walmart uh, here and the other, uh, you know, Culver's and do it. But um, we actually have a challenge with this particular tip district because while at the at least at the point that we that we annexed in the Walmart area and things like that, it apparently was appropriate to have a city boundary that um, included all of just the bike trail. But at this point, the TIF district law says that you are no longer allowed to create TIF districts that run along. Um, I don't know what the uh, legal terminology is, but it's like you're not able to run along a recreational path. So right now we're having difficulty with the planning of this district, which we wanted to cover the hospital and move back to the west to pick up some of these properties along Highway 14 because TIF law does not allow us to use a narrow recreational path as the connecting artery. So. We're working with Southwest Regional. I'm, I'm working on research on this. Um, <clears throat> uh, our attorney, Michael, will be involved with this. I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is the most appropriate path forward for us? Because typically, you want to bring in several properties. You want to be selective in what properties you bring in because, let's say, <clears throat> um, you would not want to bring Walmart in, for example. And the reason is, is because they take the base value from a percentage of your net equalized value. They have a number that we have to hit, and we can't bring too much of the property value into a TIF district. And so running over some place like Walmart makes us bring in this large amount of value, which then limits our ability to use the TIF tool in places where uh, the property hasn't developed with substantial value. Okay, so that's a lot to be said about, about that one. The other one um, we're working on is <clears throat> actually uh, downtown Richland Center. And so you'll notice to the kind of top right of this um, document, you have Story Field, which we talked about. Okay, um, is there possibility for redevelopment of Story Field? And then you have kind of a track that comes along and picks up the old hospital property takes some houses down, then picks up some other areas along Highway 14 Orange Street. Some of these properties have formerly been in a TIF district. Um, um, comes back, picks in some, again, some vacant properties on Orange, picks up uh, like Health and Human Services, um, you know, picks up some other properties and then ends up uh, landing at the, the old BMI, uh, BMO Bank downtown. So, <clears throat> they're looking at this and what they have to do is take the uh, value of every single one of these properties and move it into a calculation and then compare it to what we're actually allowed to have. And so there's actually some, some fairly technical maneuvering that has to take place um, to just figure out if this is something we would want to consider and, and present to you. And then second, um, we then have to actually prepare district documents that gets filed with the state. Those district documents, basically, by legal description, uh, meets and bounds, tell you exactly what's included in that district. So that's where we are right now. Uh, we're still in a preliminary stage of trying to refine, figure out uh, ways around or through or over some of the roadblocks we've hit, and then uh, working on some calculations to figure out how much of our allowed value we're actually contemplating using in these two separate districts. So that's my report. I have two questions. 
So the more the lime green is the proposed TIT district. So they have to connect. Is that kind of how some of these houses are getting picked up in the middle? So there has to be a connecting barrier. So then what is the blue color? The blue are actually ones. Um, so this is when when regional planning came back. And I think, uh, was that this week or last week? Late, late last week. They had identified the, the yellow. And, and we looked at it again together and we refined it and said, yeah, we probably should be contemplating also the ones in blue. So the blue represent ones that were added on from okay. our first step of looking at it. The blues are addition, additional ones. Yeah. Are you done? You yeah. You had to, okay. No, that was just the most blue one. Okay, gotcha. Um, so is there any benefit in having like that one large many property TIF district versus you know taking like that side as one district and the other side as another district? Is there Yeah. So uh, that's a great question Karen and I'm sure you could ask numerous professionals on that and get different answers. Um, my response to that is that part Part of the reason that we would want to do one this extensive is that it, it is included in your initial fee of creating this district. So these, these districts can cost up to, Mark probably has a better idea, up to $20,000 to form. Um, the two districts that we have been um, offered through grant monies through Southwest Regional Planning, um, again, it allows us to. And so if we separate into three or start parsing them off, um, if they're smaller, it probably wouldn't have to be up to $20,000, but every time we set a district, we're probably looking at at least 10, maybe 15,000. And then it also forces you into a continual monitoring process of multiple districts, which requires a separate report for, for each of the districts. So that costs you money every year. So uh, it's kind of a, cost gain. Yeah, so the reason I ask the question is I hear often that um, some TIF districts perform well and some mm -hmm. do not. So I just didn't know if by having one that is so large, does it, is it an advantage, does it perform better or do you have possibility of it performing worse? Depends on the makeup of what's inside of your district. Um, generally speaking, and I'd throw it back at Mark too if he's got more to add, but generally speaking, when you have a larger district with more property in it, it affords you the ability to capture more f new revenues, and so it actually probably is a safety factor to have one that's a little bit bigger, covering more developable properties. So yeah, there, there's so first off, you have to define why you're creating the TIF district and what's the purpose. Is it mixed use? Is it industrial? Is it blight? Um, so there has to be a purpose to it. So if you're going to create, let's say the industrial park is going to be a TIF district, well that's an industrial district. So you get District 1. But now you're going to have an area over here that's a mix of housing, commercial, um, retail, industrial, well that's mixed use. So that's a set, that's TID 2, right? So you do have an ability to make multiple TIDs based on their intended use. Um, however, if it's truly gonna be a mixed use TID, having it snake through the community is actually fairly common because you wanna get from point A to point B. And so maybe Story Field has a potential for development and then the area up 14 on the uh, northwest corner there has potential for development. Well, it makes sense for them to be connected. What's the smartest way to connect the two? And that's where you start getting creative like this. Um, the village of Potosi, we created a, a tax increment district for them. If anybody's familiar with Potosi, it sits in two valleys. Um, and it's about the, it's a 32 page legal description for the village of Potosi. Not a very big village, but it's a convoluted, you know, parcel, 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 parcel to go all the way down and then all the way back up. And, uh, and that happens. You have, have them like that because you want to connect 
in Potosi it was you wanted to connect kind of the northern area where they're doing housing development with the southern area where um, the brewing company was expanding. So that's, it was let's connect them both instead of creating two. And that goes to what Jason was saying is in that case it's both mixed use development. So why create two when you now you have to administer two of them, you have developing two of them, why not just make one? When you create multiple TIDs, that's when you have an industrial over here, you have a mixed use over here, and then a downtown blight or a blighted area here. So that's when you create multiples. And, and also there's a, a ratio, right? 70-30 split between commercial and housing or something like well, that? You, you, the max is 35% um, uh, newly platted residential, um, but you can't exceed the... 50% uh, of the area can't be um, residential. So that's, a, that's another reason why to like kind of bounce around, if you will, to capture what you can. And then uh, if TIFs aren't performing well, there's potential for taking from, from one district to donate essentially yes. to another to support one that's not mm -hmm. performing as well. So that would be an argument for having more than one. Okay. And, and then when you write in your plan, you write in that uh, you're going to allow for the half mile radius. So what that means is the TID can contribute to projects. As a TID's generating revenue, it can contribute to projects within a half mile of its boundary. So it's not going to take increment from anything in the half mile, but let's say there's a sewer main that had backups and it's on this street, but the TID's here. The TID can actually pay for that because it's a benefit to the community. Uh, last week, when I was at the hospital for a meeting there, I asked them what their plans were for the building. And they said they didn't know, yeah. either for the building or for the parking. Right. But they did say, oh, the city might be interested in the parking for development to purchase. Does that sound? Maybe. Maybe, okay. Maybe. Then the hospital itself, they said they have also, a deconstruction plan. I don't think we've seen that if they do. Have you seen that, Ashley, or Jay? I've not seen that. We've I have not seen the plan that I asked, and they did say they, there's a backup. Okay. They had a deconstruction plan. Didn't know that. I've asked Mr. Oh. Riesler that. <laughs> so, straight off the press. Thank you. More question. So, suppose such thing exists as an easy TIF, and it lined up this property to build this thing how long does it take to get one going the fastest you can create a tiff is 45 days what's typical uh we tip we tr we push for 90. Okay. so um the deadline to create so there's a couple things here the deadline to create a tiff that takes effect in 2023 values yeah. is october 31st Right, but the city would have to pass a resolution before September 30th. Okay. But that's if you're trying to capitalize on today's value. Yeah. Um, but in essence, you would have, and from now until next September 30th, for city council to pass the resolution and then turn in all the corresponding documents by the end of October for it take to for it to take effect on January 1 of 24 okay. to go backwards. Um, so that's kind of the time frame. Often we start in the middle of the summer, like July, so that we go July, August, September, that's your 90 days, and the project's done. Because you have to schedule your joint review board meetings, you have to uh, do the plan commission meetings, you have to, if there's blight, then you gotta get your uh, RDA or CDA involved. Um, so there's other entities that have to be involved throughout the process, that's why we say 90 days. Um, but we did, I forget who it was, we did one, it started in the middle of August and had it finished by the end of September, beginning of October. And that was a, like a 47 days time frame. Interesting thing to me, we say a lot how significant the hospital project is. Uh, this is one illustration of what it really means to the community beyond just the fact of a new hospital, which in itself is a huge development having a new hospital, but look at this. So we're talking about two potential TIF districts that both hinge on that hospital project, the one on 14 East 
is because it's being built where it is and the one downtown incorporates the existing hospital property because it would be vacated. So you talk about economic development and trying to plan the future of the city and you see how much this thing matters. Way beyond the fact that it's a new hospital. Look what it does to our development map. I mean, Jason, how do you feel about that? I mean, like, I don't know, you can overstate how much that project means in the planning of the city right now. I, yeah, I mean, I think... Oh, the, the answer. I think I, I, I had the opportunity to visit with Phil this morning on the radio, and I expressed that in any community there are, um, there are anchoring amenities or anchoring businesses, uh, community anchors, right? Well, typically those are people gathering spaces, right? So, yeah, it's pretty difficult to overstate what a community anchor like a hospital or a, a large convenience store or a municipal building or a county building. Those are all places where people come and congregate um, and, and come to do to participate in the economy. So, um, yeah, it, it would be really interesting if you got with a highly detailed mathematician that tried to figure out the economic effect of the hospital because it's far beyond what anybody can imagine, I'm then, sure. Then let me look at where the city may invest, and we're talking millions of dollars here if you start doing these big tips that are huge projects, and what it takes to put one together and, and get it right and everything, all the committee meetings, everything else. And in this case, so you've got the new hospital on a new property that would be annexed, that would expand the city to the east, that would put utility infrastructure to the east in a place it's never been, that would allow for future expansion to the east later, and in this, at the same time vacates what is that, two and a half city blocks or whatever it is, where the current hospital is, right in the middle of a residential neighborhood, right in the middle of town, all tied into one thing, that we call a hospital, it's a lot bigger than how many beds are in the new building. This this project and what it means to the future of the city. And that's why all this work's being done right now to try to draw all this up and we still don't even know when the hospital will go and how it'll go, all of that. This is how much planning this is gonna take. It's already been how many how many meetings have you been in? <laughs> I don't I, I should probably keep a count, but um, <laughs> Ashley, you've been in a lot of them too, Mayor. There's there's a there's a lot of meetings that going in, and I you know I stated that this morning as well. It's like it's some people look at it very narrowly, and they say, well, you're just doing work uh, hypothetically. If if you're not a a, uh, a person that's for the hospital development, well, you're you're spending you're wasting a lot of time on the hospital. Well, I don't look at it that way. Number one, number two. Um, when you're looking at a development of that um, significance, all of the work that you're doing is spilling over into the entirety of the surrounding community. I mean, it's affecting the way that we look at our roads and traffic patterns, and it's affecting the way that we look at even um, potential participation in our high schools, and it's affecting the way that we look at um, how attractive our community is for people to want to move here. And so um, it's very easy to uh, oversimplify a statement like, well, it's just benefiting this and, react, and and my job is to figure out in economic development, know how it's contributing to the overall economic environment of your community. And again, it's always much broader than the single project that you're working on, so. Okay, questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead, Ray. I have a question. I understand the reasoning for connecting the dots for the district, but why do we have Crosscut Park at the end of it within the district? Um, so it doesn't, um, Crosscut Park isn't a taxable area, and so the thought process behind that was at one point there was this conversation about the potential for there being um, additional municipal buildings there. I think it was a library at one point a couple years ago it said, so it doesn't cost us anything to design it into the district. It doesn't take any tax value away from anyone, and, but it does offer flexibility inside of planning, basically. You could use it if the land if you wanted to in the TIF, but if you never do, it didn't hurt anything. Oh, yeah. That's, no. that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Going back to the uh, 
one on Highway 14 East. Yeah. Pull that map up. The piece of property that is south of the um, bike path there. Yeah. How much of that would be in the floodplain? Along the tree line. Not, most of it is not. Some of it is, most of it is not. Well, if we're talking about this entire area here, I think this probably represents close to, uh, it's probably over 80 acres, 90 acres, and um, at least half of that would be a uh, floodplain. But again, it, that is not really of consequence to the district because you're, any property that's valued inside a floodplain carries a very small cost per acre value. And so you're, you know, you're a couple thousand dollars on forty thousand, and our TIF allowance is, uh, is it, twelve percent? Twelve percent of our net equalized value, which right now I think was close to thirty million. So I mean, when we're talking about the value of floodplain in the context of twelve percent of our net value of our city, it. it it's inconsequential, and so then you just follow property boundaries is what's happening there, right? Okay. Yeah, you can only include whole parcels. Okay. So if you're going to include that field, let's say, you have to include the entire parcel into the okay. exercise. Thank you. Anything else on item five? Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, set the meeting date for the next meeting, which is the fourth Wednesday of the month. Does somebody have that date? 1122. Status stuff. Oh, is that what do we have in there? I've got a blank. Yeah, we didn't have any. Yeah, it's on the agenda, but there's nothing under the heading. Correct, and this would be an opportunity too, if there was any uh, suggestions that anyone on the commission wanted to make for agenda items, we could um, also potentially include there if you're seeking an update on anything. Probably wayfinding signs. You want that on next month? Sure. I panorama would recommend What's what? that? Panorama. If you want to. I'm going to get an update on it in about five minutes. <laughs> um, and the PCC. If you're going to talk to him. Okay. <laughs> if he's going to talk to him, let's see. We'll I'm, I was just. Don't worry, I'll talk to you about it in just a minute. <laughs> this is where any um, update for the hotel would be in this? It can be. If you, do you have one? I do. Go for it. So I just heard back today that um, based on, well, let me pull this up so I don't say it wrong. Basically, the update based on um, the surveys, uh, preliminary discussions that they've had, so as far as the study, um, that we would be able to handle a 52 to 58 room hotel. 52 to what? 58. So I'm actually, maybe talk to both of you, to, um, she's asking for the process to to proceed, which is getting construction costs from their builder, we can move ahead. Because this was the this is the point that if we could not do like a 35 room, that you know. So it's been deemed viable, and this is what triggers the second exactly second half. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's good. Moving forward. So that's good. That is great. Now, how was the experience? <laughs> What's the experience been like doing this? It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, because you brought the lady, I met the lady, brought yep. her to the Tessins. Yep. So what did you guys do that day? We went all around town. <laughs> we got to one point, and she asked about something up ahead. Um, and we're like, well, we'll get to that one. She goes, like, what do you do, have like a map of where you're going to go? And we're like, yes, we do. We have <laughs> this all planned out. Did you really? So yeah, so it was, yeah, it was great. We took them all the way around, everything, from the county fair to the Tessins. So. Candice, are you enjoying the process of uh, the hotel study? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah, it's been great. Um, 
yeah, we got surveys in from businesses uh, around town, and that was nice to see people participate in that. Um, but yeah, it's been really nice, and it's really exciting that we can uh, assist, or they, you know, predict that we can sustain fifty up to fifty-eight rooms. So very exciting. I think so too. Yeah, I mean, I think we all kind of feel that we need oh, yeah. uh, a hotel, but I was, I was thinking it would be max of forty-eight. That's really what I thought. So, um, all right. So I was thrilled. So on to the next phase. Yes, next step. that's great news. Yeah. Any other status updates? I mean, under that item, can I just share real quick on panorama? Of course. I mean, the so just real quick, Ray. The um, panorama is in a process of going back through financial uh, performa review with Ellers. Okay, so Ellers has a is working on a new proposal from Panorama Estates. That proposal, which um, the council authorized us moving ahead on, was um, the review of actual construction of buildings two and three simultaneously. Um, so there was a uh, a new executive developer introduced um, um, that was at at a meeting that we had and so we're back in trying to figure out uh, the numbers they provide how it's going to perform how it affects the tip district and ellers has not reported back to us yet at this point they're still gathering information from um, the new executive developer of panorama so when last i spoke to that gentleman they were meeting i want to say a week or ten days ago to finalize the information ellers asked for from them have we heard if Ellers got it? That's all I... I have not heard. Okay, that's the next thing we need to find out because they were supposed to have it by now so so they could complete their review. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you about in a few minutes anyway. I will give you more information if you want it. Yep. Okay, any other status updates? Okay, so Wait the... Finding? Yes, no. no. You, you can comment on this if you want um, to. Sure, wayfinding signs. I just didn't know if... There you go ahead. Went that far. Um, so we um, we did submit our plan to the DOT, and um, he came back with uh, some really great comments. Um, said that the project looked looked great. That this um, the mock-ups and the the signs looked wonderful as well. And he just had a couple of suggestions, so I made those changes. Added one other one other item where we took things off. You know, because there's space on that sign. We, it, not only for that, but it, it kind of makes sense. So sent that in, and I'm just waiting to hear back. So once we have approval from DOT, um, the RFP has been updated. We'll be ready to go for for request for proposal. Awesome. So that's, so that's moving on to. That's moving. It's moving, but I would not commit to a timeline because the last review process <laughs> that we had with the DOT probably took, I don't know, it was a month. Or more longer. Well, he did, but there was only a few that he just had to look at. So I know I'm, we'll I'm staying there. optimistic. But it's moving. But it's moving. It's, mo oh, it's moving. It's moving. It's moving. Yeah. I'm just not making any promises because I've been in the promises field before, and you get wrapped up with the DOT, and something happens, and well, and and I'll just say that um, probably typically from all the other wayfinding sign projects I've looked at, yeah. that the that they have what you would call a package probably um, through an engineering firm, that type of thing. Yeah. Ours wasn't quite, it wasn't quite that, so yeah. you probably had to go through a few more, uh, I don't know, layers of, hmm, I wonder what, yeah. <laughs> not, not really wondering. Because we did provide um, all the locations, all of the sign information, and even actual placements from, from the maps, but. Um, Good. So. Anyway, I think, it'll, I think it'll move right along. Okay. He's been really, really good to work with, so. Good deal. When he has time to work by. Okay. Anything else for status updates? Okay, next uh, meeting date, fourth Wednesday of the month, 5.30 p.m. Um, November 22nd. November 22nd. And that is the day before Thanksgiving. We're going to be able to have a quorum. 
if we need to move it, we will. But let's see, well, number one, what the agenda is going to look like and so forth. We might have uh, something that may require a public hearing, so yeah. it, it will be important that we do set it in stone so we can publish notice. Yeah, I mean, if we move it, we better, if we have to do what dates do we need to move forward or back so we can, is there anything that has to be published in the paper, any of that? So it's probably going to be a class two notice, which means that we'd have to do the, it'd have to be in the paper the two weeks prior to the meeting. So seven days, like seven days in between the second notice and the meeting. Um, so probably best maybe to look at the, that following Wednesday. Later in the month. Then. Right, so the 29th would be the next one. And this is the first Wednesday of the month in November is the first of November. So we kind of have a weird yeah, month right. anyway. Does anybody have a problem? Does it matter the 22nd or the 29th? Would you rather not be here the night before Thanksgiving? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we have a mm -hmm from over there. So the 29th, can you do the 29th? Because sure. we got it. We have to have a quorum. I can do either one. Thank you. Ms. Miller, 29th, okay? Sure. Sorry, the 29th would be okay for me. Candace the 22nd, is in. No, it's all good. 29th, Mr. Jelani? No problem. 29th it is. Great. At 5.30 p.m. And I also have to uh, just announce that there was for that, um, the land division that you guys recommended on to council tonight, uh, there was a letter that was sent to the adjacent property owners and there was a typo in there, so I just want to be sure to correct that it listed the next council meeting as November 8th, but it's Tuesday, November 7th. Okay. Thank you. All right, that takes care of the next meeting date. Next on the agenda is adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? No second. All in favor of adjourning tonight's meeting, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Candace. Meeting is meeting is adjourned. Thanks. Thanks. I think she have a good night, Candace.